Welcome everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and a special welcome to those of you in New Glasgow joining us through telehealth. Um, I have the pleasure this evening of introducing our speaker, Dr. Cheryl Gilbert McLeod. Dr. Gilbert McLeod graduated in 2000 from the University of British Columbia with a degree in clinical psychology. She joined the IWK Health Center in 2000 as a clinical psychologist, or rather in 1999. 1999, yeah. Um, she holds a cross appointment with the psychiatry department at Dalhousie University and plays an active role in training psychology students and psychiatry residents. She specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of childhood anxiety disorders as well as autism spectrum disorders. And several years ago, Dr. Gilbert McLeod developed an interest in childhood obesity. She's played an active role in developing program proposals in the treatment of obesity in young children. And she's an advocate for the prevention and management of obesity at the IWK Health Center. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cheryl Gilbert McLeod. Thank you, Melanie. Hello, everybody. Hi, New Glasgow. Um, so I work at Maritime Psychiatry, which is one of our community, our mental health um, outpatient clinics that we have. It's a specialty clinic, and like Melanie said, I do mostly anxiety and some autism. But there's a, a team at the IWK called the IWK Obesity Team. Is that, I think that's right. And we um, have been have there's a number of us there's a different professionals there's psychologists there's nutritionists there's some of our management teams there are a number of doctors pediatricians endocrinologists who really have an active interest in this population in the prevention and education as well as trying to see if we can work around trying to get some treatment programs up and running so we've really advocated for this group of kids for a long time um, what I'm hoping to do today is to be able to give our audience an understanding of what obesity is, how we define it, what we know about what causes obesity, and then what we can do as parents and professionals to help kids who have obesity. We're not going to get into the actual evidence-based treatment for it because that's like a whole other hour talk. But there's lots of things that we know that we can do just by changing our day-to-day -day things that we do in our life. And that's what we're going to spend some time on tonight. So what is obesity? So the International Obesity Task Force actually defines obesity as something called a body mass index. And your body mass index is your weight in kilograms, which I know is a confusing thing. I never know what a weight is in kilograms. I always have to go from pounds and then do the 2.2 thing. And I know that's confusing. But a BMI requires the kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Again, most, most of us don't know what our height is in meters, but this is something that your family, your family doctor, your child's pediatrician, it's a really standard um, calculation that they do. And the measurements that they take are typically in kilograms and meters. So they can figure this out for you really very easily. And why we use BMI is we know it's very reliable, it's easy to calculate, and we also know that it correlates with the key factors. So it correlates with your adiposity. It correlates with the comorbid conditions that we often see. Those are the medical, medical conditions we see in kids who are often obese, and as well as the long-term mortality rate. So it tells us a lot of information. We know that children or adolescents with a BMI more than the 95th percentile, so that's once you've done that calculation, it actually gives you a score usually between like 18 and 30. And then we have tables that actually tell us, depending on what your rating is, at what percentile you are. So if your percentile is greater than the 95th percentile, meaning that out of 100 kids at the exact same age as your child and the same gender as your child, that they are heavier than 95 of those children, then they are considered obese. We also know that for children who have a BMI more than the 85th percentile, but less than the 95th percentile, that they're considered overweight. Okay? So tonight, a lot of the times I'm going to be talking about overweight slash obese, 
So that is anybody who has a body mass index of 85% or greater, or sometimes I will refer just to the obese population, which is that 95% and up. Okay? And we know that for adults, we can say if your BMI is greater than you know, 28 or 29, then you're considered obese. With kids, it's a much smaller number, and the change is really very age-specific. So sometimes for a young child, it could be a BMI of like 16, which could be, be considered normal, but a BMI of 17 might be considered overweight, and a BMI of 18 might be considered obese, which is why it's really important that if you're looking at these issues, you have a family practitioner or a pediatrician helping you guide whether or not the changes you're making are actually affecting the BMI because it's really a minute change and it's very specific to the age of your child and the gender of your child. Okay, so what causes obesity? We would love to be able to say that there is this big gene out there that causes obesity or there's this disease that you catch that causes obesity, but it's not the case. It's not like um, you're just walking down the street and you catch obesity. And only less than 5% of the children actually have an underlying disease that causes obesity. For most kids, obesity develops, as with overweight, when, when you're intaking more energy than you're expending. So you're eating more food, and the calories in that food that you're eating is way more than what you're expending. We also know that your weight is going inter to interact with the things that are happening in your environment. So availability of food. If you, know, if you live in a household where there's lots of cookies and processed food and freezer snacks that you pop into the microwave, and then there are behavioral tendencies in the family that you know, we eat really big suppers really close to bed, and we don't go out for family walks very often, and we like to eat in front of the TV, then those are all family activities that we know interact with weight. We also know that the level of physical exercise does affect your weight. We also know that psychosocial stress does. And you know, I know that when I'm feeling blue, or if I'm really tired, that bag of popcorn, or those two white brownies, which really are fabulously delicious, but should never be allowed in anyone's freezer. Um, <laughs> that those are the things that we go for. They kind of give you that rush that make you feel better. And eating is often kind of one of those pleasure activities that when we're not feeling very well, we do. And all that interacts with what you're doing with your life. So if you're a marathon runner and you eat the two bite brownies, it's probably okay. And for the average person, eating a couple of two bite brownies isn't going to be a big deal. It's when you eat the whole bag of the two bite brownies because you're sitting there and you're watching TV and you're not going for your walks and you're not expending your energy and it, you're making other choices that it becomes a problem. So we also know that there's something that, well, that we call family circles. So if you live in a household and both your mom and dad are a normal weight, Okay, so their BMI is, in what, is falling in what we call the average range, then the child only has a 7% chance of actually developing a severe weight problem. Okay? If one, just one of those parents is overweight, not even obese, so overweight, so their BMI is greater than the 85th percentile, that risk increases to 40%. Okay? And that all of a sudden is those factors that I was telling you about before. So what's available in your food, what's happening in the family. If both parents are overweight, the child's risk of becoming overweight doubles to 80%. So you can all of a sudden see that what's happening in the family is really very important. And that's why when we talk about obesity and we talk about being overweight, we never just talk about what the child's doing. It's always a family, the family has to make changes and the family has to look at what they're doing. And it's not a, you know, name, blame or shame thing. It's let's figure out how we all can help each other because a lot of the times somebody else in the household is overweight as well. So the prevalence of obesity. 
I'm sure everyone's heard that the prevalence has increased dramatically over the last little while. So I have some information for you about how much it actually has increased. So in 2004, we know that 26% of Canadian children and adolescents aged 2 to 17, yes, we see obesity in preschoolers, were overweight or obese. So that's 85th percentile or, or above. If you look at just the 95th percentile or above, 8% of them are obese. That's a pretty big number, and it's gone through some huge changes. Because in 1978 or 1979, which was the last time we actually, the, the Census Canada actually collected the data where they went and measured the children, um, their height and weight, instead of based on parental report, because we're all not that very good at saying how much we actually weigh and how tall we are, because we all like to fudge those numbers. Um, that 15% of 2 to 17 year olds were overweight or obese and only 3% were obese. And, and so when we actually look at what that is, is if you look at the combined rates for overweight or obesity for each sex, that's a 70% increase since 1978. So we're definitely doing something wrong. And when we look at which age group or who is actually changing the most, what we find is that adolescents between the ages of 12 to 17 have increased the most. So their rates have doubled from 14% to 29%, which is a lot of teens if we're thinking that roughly 30% of 12 to 17 year old children or adolescents or teens are overweight or obese. And we do have the flip side then of the number of kids who actually have eating disorders um, and they're underweight to the point that they're harming themselves medically as well. Um, so what about Nova Scotia? Nova Scotia is a wonderful province to live in. We all, Atlantic provinces, I'm a big fan of being in Nova Scotia. We're not that healthy. And what you see is that the Atlantic provinces, compared to across Canada, have the highest overweight or obesity rates. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're looking at 36% of our children. In New Brunswick, it's 34%. And in Nova Scotia, it's 32%. And in PEI, it's 30%. And this actually is not just from one source. We have collaborative data that's showing us that Nova Scotia really is around 32%. There was a recent study that looked at just grade five students in Nova Scotia, and they found that overweight children were 32.9% and we had an obesity rate of pretty much 10%. And this slide is actually in adults, but what's really neat about it is it shows you the different areas in Nova Scotia and what's happening. So if you look at the pale blue, that's us, Capital District Health, I think we are, and there's our little peninsula of Halifax. We're not doing too bad, um, but if this is an adult and the national average is 14.9 according to 2001. So in 2001, the adults were over in the national average, but not too bad in kind of more kind of urban sites. As we move down to the red, which is kind of um, like South Shore, Bridgewater, we jump up to 27.9, which is two times the national average for adults. Um, and now my Nova Scotia geography is going to fall apart. Pale pink would be Cape Breton. I know that one. Purple, I don't know what we would call that. Anyone? New Glasgow, I'm really sorry. I don't know what to call you. Um, the green, help me out anyone. Amherst, is that Amherst and above? And um, the yellow, thank you, Anne. Annapolis Valley at 20.5. So you can see there's a really big difference with some of the more rural areas being the highest. So Cape Breton at 24 and the South Shore at 27.9. So it's not just our kids who are the heaviest, it's our adults as well. So why is it that the overweight and obesity rates are increasing? So we know 
that over half of Canadians between 5 and 17 are actually not active enough for the optimal growth and development. So we have this little rule that says that you should burn at least 8 kilo kilocalories per kilogram of body weight per day. Okay? But we know that we don't, we're not doing that. Our kids are not spending enough energy for what they're taking in. Um, and that's not necessarily a problem with what they're taking in. They may very well be following the Canada's Food Guide and taking in the proper foods and eating really well, but they're still not expending the energy that they need, which is why we quite often see parents say, well, my kids love fruits and vegetables. They, they eat a really healthy diet, and we just don't understand why. But they're sedentary. They're not moving around. Um, and Canadian girls are less active than Canadian boys. Pick up hockey on the street is less likely for girls than it is going to be for boys. Going for your bike ride, um, doing your mountain biking, your trails through Point Pleasant Park, all those things are less likely to happen if you're a girl than if you're a boy. You're less likely to take gym classes in high school if you're a girl than if you're a boy. And you're less likely to do competitive sports. We also know that over half of Canadian children take the bus to school. Where when, you know, I grew up, most of us walked. Didn't, you know, and you walked large distances. You know that saying, you know, I walked to school and back uphill both ways. You know, we did. We spent a lot more time walking than we ever, ever, ever do now. And now it's, you know, the safety issues. You know, there's too many busy roads to cross and there's not a crossing guard. And I completely understand why that's happening, but we're not compensating for that lack of exercise in the mornings. We also know that we're not so good at eating our fruits and veggies. And that 59% of Canadian children and adolescents are eating less than, the, the recommendation is that you eat fruits and vegetables five times a day. And 59% of us, of our kids, are not doing that. And we know that if you do eat vegetables less than five times a day, you're significantly more likely to be overweight or obese than those who actually eat them more frequently. And they, so they did a study where they said if you eat less than five or five or more, and the five or more, their weights were in the much more considered in the average range. Um, we also know that children who buy lunch at school are an increased risk of being overweight. You know, which makes us parents who are really busy and l making lunches for three kids and how do you do that and, uh, you know, it's not meant to make us feel guilty, but at the same time, the cafeteria choices that our kids have aren't that great. And they can get pizza and they can get, you know, sandwiches that are pre-made with lots of butter and lots of margarine and lots of, um, mayonnaise on them and they have like the processed things on them that we know are not good choices for them. Or the french fries or the cookies that our cafeterias, they're really good, they're a really good income for cafeterias because they're cheap to make but they're not healthy for our kids. And surprisingly families, well actually it's not surprising but it's an interesting stat. Families who eat supper together three or more times a week are at a decreased risk for being overweight or obese. But in double parent families where both parents are working or single parent families where one parent is working and so socioeconomic status being what it is and that sometimes parents are working nights and they miss having supper, that's not happening as much as it used to. Where all the television shows used to be that you'd sit down and everyone had supper together as a family and it was an everyday occurrence. It doesn't happen as much, but it's a real protective factor for our kids. Sitting down and having a meal together three times or more a week helps you. Having two or more physical education classes a week at school. You know, compensating for the fact that 51% of our kids take the bus. But we also know that gym classes get cut and sometimes it's one class per six day cycle, which is sometimes not even once a week then. So we also know that in six to 11 year olds, two or more hours of screen time per day is associated with an increased risk of being overweight or obese. And by screen time, we're talking about video games, 
computer time, spending time MSNing, um, watching TV, watching movies. And when you actually look at it, so if you're two or more hours, your rate is 35% versus less than two hours is 18%. And if you actually look at the stats just for obesity, so 11% of six to 11 year olds are going to be obese if you watch two or more hours a day versus 5% if you watch less than two hours. Okay. And for adolescents, less than 10 hours a week is a decreased risk of being overweight or obese. So 23 versus 35 for adolescents who have actually 30 or more hours of screen time. And for them, it's not so much the TV, but it's the hours they spend text messaging. You know, sitting and even sitting with their cell phones, where you can do so much on a cell phone nowadays, that's considered screen time. You know, they're sitting on the bus or they're sitting on the street corner and they've gone outside with their friends, but they're not running around or going for a walk. They're text messaging themselves <laughs> and, and their friends on their cell phones. Okay, and because I work in the mental health field, I wanted to talk a little bit about we know that the mental health issues around obesity. So there's huge medical um, factors with obesity and risk factors. These kids have you know, orthopedic problems and cardiovascular problems and they're at increased risk for a number of different um, medical disorders. But what about mental health? So we know that in overweight or obese children and adolescents, they often report lower self-esteem, increased rates of sadness, loneliness and nervousness have been reported. Okay. We also know that in children, if you are overweight and you stay overweight, that over time your self-esteem is going to decrease. So it may be that at five or six your self-esteem is fine, but the, by the time you're 13 or 14, your self-esteem is going to have taken a little bit of a beating just from being overweight, not from having anything else going on. Um, and when we talk about self-esteem, self-esteem usually has a number of different facets, facets to it, but most of the time for self-esteem here, we're talking about body image. So how they view themselves and the self-esteem that's linked with, you know, when you look in a mirror, how happy you are. Um, unfortunately, ob obese children who actually have falling self-esteem are also more likely to engage in some of the high-risk behaviors that we don't like to see our kids engage in. They're more likely to smoke, and they're more likely to drink. Obese girls are more likely than average weight, average weight girls to think of themselves as poor students. Not because they actually make poor grades, but they just perceive themselves, you know, I'm fat, therefore I'm stupid. Um, both obese girls and boys expect not to finish college. And being obese or overweight has the immediate psychosocial effects of social isolation, discrimination, and peer problems. And there have been a number of studies that have been done that have shown that if you look at a population of high, high school students and you say, tell us who your five friends are, that obese, obese individuals are the ones who are going to endorse five friends, but those five friends aren't going to endorse them. And they may have no friendship endorsements, or they're going to be so far on the perimeter of a friendship circle that they may only have gotten one endorsement. And the discrimination starts as young as preschoolers. If you give a preschooler a list of, um, you know, character traits like happy, smart, um, friendly, and then you give them kind of like nondescript ones like okay and things like that and the negative ones like stupid and mean and you ask them to put them on a picture of a figure where one figure is an average weight one figure is underweight and one figure is overweight they're going to give the stupid mean not very nice stickers to the overweight person and we're talking three and four year olds who are already making those judgments that we hear all the time and it's a pretty big thing in the media nowadays where you can see, you know, people walking down the street and you, you hear the comments and, you know, obese adults are often, you hear them saying, you know, people, they don't give me room on the bus or they say mean things to me or I don't get the same services because people look down on me. 
well, our three and four year olds are starting to say the exact same thing that's actually happening to adults. But with these mental health issues, despite the fact that we know that they are seeming to report self-esteem issues, the discrimination, the peer problems, the alcohol, the smoking is happening, that just because you're obese, if you actually look at the prevalence of population, so those 26% of kids who are overweight or obese, that doesn't mean that, that those 26% are actually have more mental health problems than the other people. What happens is that when you look at the people who are actually being seen clinically, the obese individuals actually are reporting higher rates. But there are lots of people who are overweight or obese who don't have mental health issues. Much the same way as there's lots of people out there who you think should be anxious or should have problems with depression, and they don't. And they're happy with the way they look, and they're happy with what's going on in their life, and they have no issues. Um, so what we know is obesity doesn't coincide with psychological problems, but the degree, so how obese you are, and how long you've been obese for, can play a decisive role in psychopathology. And what we know is that poor emotional functioning in obese children and depressive symptoms in obese adolescents can actually proceed the obesity. So it's not always obese kids then develop problems. You can have kids who are depressed, sad, anxious, have, having a lot of issues, mental health issues, who then become overweight or obese. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, what can parents and professionals do to help? That screen time is such a big thing. As a parent and as a professional, spending time and looking at what your family's activities are, and as a professional, asking families and really educating them about screen time is really important. The greater number of hours spent in sedentary pursuits, so sitting on the couch, playing video games, watching, going to the movies, all those things, is associated with being overweight, it's, which makes a lot of sense, right? But we also know that actually just watching TV is an independent predictor of a change in a child's BMI and skin folds. So if you decrease the amount of time that they're allowed to watch TV, you can make a change in BMI. And skin folds is those really nasty pincher tests that no one likes to do that you can probably remember when, you know, that they did those Canadian excellence things through when we were in elementary school and junior high and you, you know, get the gold and the bronze. I never got higher than bronze, so I... <laughs> um, I was, that's why I'm blocking on the name of what they are. Um, and they used to do your skin folds to see how they are. That's what we're talking about there. We know that if you're sitting and watching TV, that you see these food advertisements. You know, the things that as a parent you've decided I'm never buying for my child, but then they're sitting there watching TV and they see these ads for these foods that you're like, how do you even know what that is? That's never been in my house. But watching it, makes them ask for it. Because advertisement, that's the whole purpose of it. It makes you want to get it. Um, we also know on the flip side, it exposes you to really those thin images, which children and adolescents idealize, and which so few of the population can actually achieve. And that can lead to self-esteem problems. If you're overweight or obese, and you're sitting on the couch, and you're watching these incredibly thin, beautiful, attractive men and women, and you're like, I want to look like that, and then you look down and you're like, there's no way I can look like that. That's going to cause problems. And those goals are just not attainable for so many people. Um, so when we actually look at what's the rule of thumb for screen time, the Canadian Pediatric Society recommends no more than one and a half hours a day. That's combined. Video, Game Boy, anything that you can think of that sit on the couch and use your thumbs to move it around one and a half hours. American society, I think, is still at two, but Canada is at 1.5. And that's not very much if you actually think about, you know, do your kids turn on the TV or the computer or are they MSNing before they actually leave in the morning? And if they come home for lunch and what are they doing during school? And, you know, you don't get home from work until 5.30, but your kids get home at 3.30. And what are they doing for those two hours? Because, you know, 
as much as we'd love to think that they're making supper and <laughs> doing all their homework, in my experience, that's not usually what happens. You can also look at what you and your child are drinking. These are just little changes that you and your family can start to make. So, juice. You know, juice is yummy. Juice is not good. <laughs> we don't need more than six to eight ounces of juice a day. It doesn't have any of the fiber that, you know, eating an apple has. And it doesn't do as much. It can cause constipation. It can do all sorts of things. And just drink water. It's much healthier. Or cut your young child's juice with water so that the six to eight ounces is spread out over the day. Look at your milk. Learn to switch from when you're supposed to switch from homo to 2% to 1% or even skim milk. The differences in milk is unbelievable and I actually have them written down here for you. So homo milk has 49% calories from fat and has about 8 grams of fat per cup. 2% is 35% calories with 4.7 grams per cup. 1% has 23%, so and everyone's like 1%, yes, that's really good. Still has 23% calories from fat and 2.6 grams of fat per cup, which is not too bad actually, but skim milk, and I know skim tastes gross, is um, 4% and is 0.4 grams per cup. And it's much water, but it's a big difference. You know, you can go from 49% to 0.4. If you're looking at trying to decrease the amount of calories that your kids are intaking, that's a great way of doing it. Just making that simple cut from homo to skim or 2% to skim. And I would, you know, doing it gradually because there's a big taste difference between skim and 2%. Um, also look at, you know, those drinks that, like those sports drinks that come in the super size containers, you know, they're like 16 ounces that those, and they're you know, those really attractive colors that kids really go for because something about drinking something blue is really great. <laughs> you know, most of those have about 70 grams of sugar in them, which is actually 15 spoonfuls. So think about taking a glass, 16 ounces of water, taking a teaspoon, and going like this 15 times and stirring it and drinking it. That's what you get in a lot of those fruit drinks. Um, but we're like, they're really, you know, they're fun to drink and, you know, they're really good in the summer for our really active kids because it's replacing all those minerals and vitamins that they've missed. Not really. <laughs> and it, despite the commercials, you never sweat the blue and yellow and the green that you see. It doesn't work that way. So the, the pop in the sports drinks really needs to be limited. Look at your food choices. What's a healthy portion size? What does the Canada's Food Guide actually say? And I did print off a few copies of the Canada's Food Guide just to become really familiar with it. Like, how many fruits and vegetables are you supposed to be having? What is a serving of meat? What is a serving of cheese? And how does it differ from my young kids versus my older kids? Looking at things that are in your cupboards. So chips, <coughs> frosted snack cakes, pizza snacks, breakfast pastries, fast food, processed bread, you know, so white bread versus grain bread or 100% whole wheat, um, regular mayonnaise, butter, margarine, high caloric meats that you can buy at the lunch counter, candy, ice cream, cookies, and cakes. At no point are we saying don't eat these things because if we say don't eat something, then we all want to eat it. But look at eating less of them. You know, how many times a week do you need to eat chips? And if you look at the difference between when we grew up, you know, for 25 cents or 15 cents, you could buy a really small bag of chips. Now it's like a dollar nine, and it's a huge bag of chips. And it used to be that we'd eat one bag of chips that were this size, and now we eat the whole bag, and it's this size. Even though if you flipped onto the back of it, it actually says four servings per bag. There are not very many people who would just eat, you know, and put away for the next day. Um, and a simple thing to do is when you're grocery shopping is read the labels. If it has 15 grams of sugar per serving and or 5 grams of total fat, 
that's a food you should limit. That's a treat food, a red food, if you're looking at something called a stoplight diet, where red or yellow is a caution food and green is eat as much as you want. The idea of um, eating a rainbow a day. You know, most of our colorful foods are vegetables and fruit. We're not eating enough fruit and vegetables, and we know if we do, it's a protective factor. So let's eat more colorful food, because chips really aren't that colorful. Frosted snack cakes, well, I guess it's all really white, isn't it? But look at you and your child's physical activity levels. So again, I printed off the Canada's Physical Activity Guides for Children and Youth, which actually says that for 5 to 17-year-olds, you should accumulate. So this is not 90 minutes straight. This is over the course of the day. You should accumulate approximately 90 minutes of physical activity. And that's not 90 minutes of vigorous activity. It's a combination of moderate, like riding, going for a walk around the block, and vigorous activity, so running, playing soccer. And look at ways to help as a family for all of you to be getting that, as well as what you can do for your child. So rainy days, putting a CD in, in the um, tape, in the what's, what, stereo, thank you, <laughs> and dancing with your kids. You know, it does. No, I have preschoolers, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they would probably do it. And there are things you can do. So your teenager, you know, how many hours does your teenager spend on the phone? Too many minutes. Too many minutes. But you can make a rule. You know what? You're allowed to use the phone, but you have to walk around the house while you're talking on the phone. You know, and it's as simple as that. If they're lying on their bed, you know, they've got their feet up on their wall and they've got their headphones on, and they're yakking on the phone, and they've got the bag of chips, and the popcorn, and the food right beside them. That's just all that. But you could say, you could use the phone for as long as you want, but you've got a portable phone, be portable. And that counts as moderate activity. But it's really, and I, I cannot stress this enough, that when we're looking at children and teens between the ages of 5 and 17, diet is a four-letter word and not in a good four-letter word. We are never trying to get our children to lose weight. We don't want to put our kids on diets. We want them to maintain their weight so that the BMI catches up. So if they're this tall and their weight is really big, at some point, if they're just kind of make some changes in their physical activity, they make some changes in the food they're eating, and they make some changes in the family lifestyle, their weight should start to decrease and catch up to their height. But putting them on a diet, restricting what they can eat, can just lead to so many different problems, and that's not what we want. Um, healthy eating habits are what we're aiming for. And we want to start young. We want our preschoolers to say, I'm hungry, can I have an apple or can I have some celery? We want to s encourage sustainable lifestyle activities. We don't want all our kids out there running marathons, but it would be nice if they would take walks after dinner. If they would, you know, it's a beautiful sunny day, let's go get some fresh air, or can I take the dog for a walk, or, you know, can we go to the park, or do we have frisbees in the garage? And it's not just our kids that need to make changes. If you remember back to the family circles that I talked about before, we know that usually there's at least one overweight parent. So the whole family needs to make changes. The person who does the grocery shopping needs to start to make changes. And by doing so, we can really help prevent and start to make some changes in our kids. And Nova Scotia Health Promotion has done some really good programs in the community. Um, they have an Active Kids, Healthy Kids, and I included that in one of the handouts there too. They've been working with schools to promoting healthy schools, which are focusing on healthy eating and trying to get those gym classes up. Um, healthy Eating Nova Scotia. So there's a real push for breastfeeding, which we know is a risk. Um, the resilience factor or the kids who are breastfed for longer have a decreased chance of becoming overweight or obese. Um, and not surprisingly, because Nova Scotians are not that good at breastfeeding their kids. 
Um, for children and youth, it's really focusing on fruit and vegetable consumption. They also do a lot about food security, which is, you know, for families who um, are in poverty or struggling with finances about how they can spend their money and actually know that they're going to have the money to be able to spend on the proper food because eating healthy does cost more. Um, the important thing to remember is that none of these programs should be promoting dieting. And if they do, then it's a program that you, should, you need to kind of, as a parent, say, wait a second, that woman at the IWK said no to dieting, <laughs> so I shouldn't be doing that. Um, there's the school food and nutrition policy is in the process of being developed so that all of a sudden we can start to, you know, when you walk into school and the very first thing you see is the pot machine, is that really necessary? So there, the school, Nova Scotia school boards and the um, Nova Scotia Health Promotion are trying to work on actually getting some policies around pot machines and what a cafeteria can serve. Um, and it's, it's getting there. So we're going to see some good changes, I think. Um, sport participation opportunities. So the Nova Scotia Health Promotion, Sport Canada, Education and School Boards are looking at ways to get more kids involved in sports. You know, sports are expensive. You know, hockey gear costs a fortune. And then the registration for hockey. And, you know, God forbid your child says they want to play golf because that's, like, really expensive. They're all great things we have to do. But for a lot of families, they're not in our reach. So we have to look at ways that we can actually get our kids being active and being healthy and finding ways to do that with financial. Um, there's also a good book out there that I really like. It's not an IWK. Um, well, the IWK is not saying get this book. But as a parent, if you're looking at trying to find it some ideas for what to do and how to, what sort of exercise things we're looking at, the Trim Kids book, which is a 12-week plan, is an American book. Um, it's based on American studies down, I believe, in California. And I'm sorry, there's a typo. Her name is Southern, not Sother. Um, it does a really good job. The one thing I don't like about this book is it does talk about dieting sometimes, and it pushes restricting some of your cal caloric intake. But what it does do is it talks about setting reasonable goals. And a lot of the times they push um, actually keeping your weight at the same level for your goal, not decreasing it, and not increasing it. And it does talk about physical exercise and different things you can do. It has some really nice um, menus to help parents follow. Um, 12 weeks is a drop in the bucket. And 12 weeks is not an idea. It's, um, a real small amount of time to expect a lot of change. And that 12 weeks is, is usually the thing that we say is getting you kind of over that hump of, I can start to make these changes, and now you need to go away and do them. Um, but nothing takes just 12 weeks. So, OK, I'm finished. Questions? Thank you.